morning. So we did our overview of Genesis. Well, at least the overview of the first 11 chapters last week. So this week, I kind of lied. I said we're going to spend two weeks on Genesis 1, th- verses 1 through verse 3 and Genesis 1. But we're actually only going to get through verse 2 today. But it's not going to be two verses every single week. So it's, it's not going to take us a thousand years to get through Genesis. So there's that. But <laughs> there's, there's hope, right? So, but we are going to cover um, verses 1 through 2 in Genesis 1. Because that's really where um, most heated debate happens, right? Is the first two verses of Genesis. And so we're going to dive into a little bit of that. So let's start and open with prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your word for the the clarity that it gives to our lives, Lord, and that we can trust and rely on your word, that it is true, that it is a foundation of truth for our lives, and that you, you are our creator. You've created all that we see and all that we don't see, the visible and the invisible, and you created all things for your glory. And so we just praise you and thank you for preserving this truth in scripture so that we can understand and know this truth today that you have created us and you've created us in your image for your purpose and i just pray this morning as we approach um genesis and and creation lord that we would have open eyes and open hearts and that you would just give us a new perspective of your power and your glory and your creation and we just ask these things in your name All right, so as I said, this is where much heated debate happens. Um, And, you know, people will say with creation, well, it doesn't match up with science, okay? Or creation, as explained by Genesis, is just not possible because the earth is millions of years old, not 6,000 years old. And even Christians who agree with creation have two different viewpoints, right? So you have Christians who say, well, it's a young earth, earth's only 6,000 years old. And then you have other Christians who agree, no, God God created the earth, but it's older than that, okay? So then you have people that will say science is just all wrong, okay? Or... Even the young creationist and old creationist viewpoints will start, try to make literalism a theological issue. Like, well, if you don't interpret creation as it's a young earth and only 6,000 years old, then you know what, you probably don't believe scripture's inspired and you, um, they tend to make it a spiritual issue. Well, you just don't believe God's word. You're a heretic because you don't believe the way I believe about creation. I mean, you know, and so here's the thing. So, and then on the other side, there are people that will try to make Genesis a science textbook, okay? Think about it, the miracles that Jesus did, right? Jesus turned water into wine. He healed a blind man with mud and spit. How do you scientifically explain that? You cannot, okay? So, It's not natural to our earthly understanding. So you can't take creation, right, and and, and try to make a science textbook out of Scripture and then be mad because it doesn't fit, right? So we can't expect the Bible to be a science textbook. It's not. And that's not God's point in preserving Scripture, and it certainly wasn't the point of the writer of Genesis, right? See, God's point for preserving his word and inspiring biblical writers wasn't so we could understand science better. That would be like getting mad at scripture because it's not a science textbook would be like getting mad at your dog because your dog's not a cat. It's just ridiculousness, right? So we're not approaching Genesis as a science textbook because that's not what God intended it to be and that's not what it is. But at the end of the day, here's the thing. None of us was at creation. There's no writer in all of human history that was at creation. There just weren't. No human beings were there. We weren't even created yet. So we weren't there. 
There's no video of creation that we can watch and see how it all happened, okay? But we also have to be willing not to overstate text, but be willing to see what is not contradictory to the biblical text that could possibly be true, okay? Because if there's not a conflict with the, def the biblical text, then there are different things that are plausible of how it could be. And we should be aware of them, and we should listen to other people's ideas of what is plausible and not just write them off. Like, oh, you believe the Bible could be millions of years old. You're a heretic, and you're just crazy. How can you believe that? And so then you have fighting between Christians over which is true. Instead of, hey, you know what? It's possible. You might be right. Bible might only be 6,000 years old. Guess what? You might be right. And guess what? They both might be right. But let's agree that God's the creator of all things, and both of those things may be true. Okay? So that's kind of where we're going here. Because many godly men and women who have intensely studied the scripture believe that God is a creator, that the Bible, they believe the Bible, they believe what it says, are both sides of the fence here, okay? And the thing is, you have scientists that want to discount creation because if they can discount creation, then there's no God, except for them. And if there's no God and no creator, that means they get to make the rules and how they live. That means there's no standard for right and wrong. Oh, and we can just, you know, there's no absolute truth. There's no absolute standard. There's no absolute morals. We can just live however we want to live, right? I mean, that's it. That's at the the base of getting rid of Genesis one through two. That's that's the very basis of it. Okay. So this. As we go through Genesis 1 through 2, all of Genesis is, we're not going to go here with all of it. But this is going to be a little bit different. There's going to be some grammar. We're going to look at Hebrew grammar today. Um, because, you know, I think we have in our mind the VeggieTales version of creation. But it's not quite the VeggieTales version in the Bible. So we're going to dig into Genesis 1 through 2. So let's start. So in verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the waters. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. We're not getting into verse 3, but I'm just reading it for context. Okay. Now, I don't know how many of you are thrilled with grammar or remember grammar details of school. I know I absolutely love to read, but I absolutely hated grammar. I thought it was the most ridiculous thing in the world, and it was just mind-numbingly boring, okay? But since we're dealing with not just language, English language, but we're dealing with Hebrew language, we're going to just dip our head, dip, dip a little bit into the Hebrew grammar language and how it works to give ourselves a better understanding of verse 1 and 2, okay? And it's going to help us understand how people have come about these different ideas in creation about old earth and young earth. And then hopefully this will help you when people that are very science-backed in background say, oh, but the earth is millions of years old. How can you possibly believe that it's only 6,000? You can say, you know what? You're right. You might be right. It might be millions of years old, and they're going to say, oh, what? What? You agree with me? How is that possible? You're a Christian. You're not supposed to agree with me, right? And then you can start a conversation about creation, okay? So hopefully this will help you do that. So in the original Hebrew scriptures, verse 1, okay, remember when we talked about Nahum and the first verse is actually a title, okay? So... That's one. So in the original hymn, we're going to see this later. It's sort of what, if you know anything about grammar, an independent clause, right? So it's not really a full sentence. It's kind of a, a heading, okay? All right. So what is the beginning? 
we know the beginning is not the beginning of God's existence because he's eternal, right? So the beginning is just the beginning in the context for the earth being made habitable for human life, okay? You want to know the date of creation? It's in the beginning. That's the date of creation. In the beginning. That's it, all right? It was in the beginning. So this, verse 1, is a statement explaining about what is about to happen, okay? That's where we're headed with this, okay? So we're going to go through this in detail. So the word bara, okay, you saw created, Okay, right under created, it's the Hebrew word bara. Now, we have the Veggie Tales version in our brain of creation that, you know what? There was no earth, there was, there was just this space void, and God just snapped his finger somehow, and poof, this round ball just came into existence. Just happened. But, if you, the word bara is Hebrew for create or created. Okay. If you look at other instances in creation where that same word is used, God always uses something to create. He creates something out of something. There's already matter there. So Genesis 126, verses 26 through 27. And God said, let us make humankind in our image and according to our likeness and let them rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of heaven and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every moving thing that moves upon the earth. So God created humankind in his image. In the likeness of God, he created him male and female. He created them. So did God bara or create humans out of nothing? No, he used dirt. He created the dirt, but he used the dirt, okay? What about Genesis 2? Was Eve made with pre-existing matter? She was. Adam's rib. So, bara doesn't necessarily mean creation from nothing at all, okay? Then there's an idea that between verses 1 through 3, that there has to be it's a 24-hour day that happens between verse 1 and 3. Okay? That's the other idea. So the Hebrew word for day is yom. Okay? And so, but if you look up all the places where yom is in Scripture, it doesn't have to be a 24-hour day. Right? I mean, look at it. It could be midnight. It could be moment, it could be a season, it could be a short time, it could be times, it could be work time, it could be early morning, I mean, it could be end, I mean, there's all these options, a generation, a generation certainly not 24 hours, right? So there's no evidence that verses 1 through 3 happened in a 24-hour period of time, Okay. So it doesn't have to mean 24 hours. So the biblical writers, remember we're always talking about we have to get out of our culture and put our brain in their perspective, their worldview. So with respect to the natural world and God, in their perspective, in their view, God was the point of origin for natural reality. That's what we call science, right? In their perspective, in their worldview, God is the point of origin for science. And I think we'd all agree with that. You know, it's, it is true, okay? Because science wouldn't exist apart from God. The problem is, is our science is viewed through human culture viewpoint instead of from God's point of view. There perspective of science, natural reality, and biblical truth, they mesh together. They don't separate the two. They don't separate biblical truth and natural reality, okay? And I don't see how they can be separated. God creates all things. He created us. He created the world. He's the source of all things. I mean, you can't separate the natural world from that. 
It's just, it's impossible, and it's completely illogical. So God is the source of all things, so we need to remember that God inspired the Scripture writers to write. Scripture affirms a creator God who is distinct from his creation, which requires God to be the creator of all things visible and invisible, the things that we can't see. And we're going to look at a couple of these verses later, but just for your own personal reference, Colossians 1.16, 1 Corinthians 8.6, Romans 11.36, Hebrews 1.2, Hebrews 11.3, and Psalm 33.6 and verse 9. So God cre- God's creation, the visible and the invisible, includes a physical and a spiritual world. It's both. Okay? There are script things in Scripture that are created by God that aren't necessarily all laid out for us in Genesis. And we know that because there's mentions of other things throughout the Bible that happened prior to the earth being made habitable for humankind. But they're not all laid out for us in Scripture or in Genesis. And part of the reason for that is because that's not our lane anyway. This is what we're responsible for, is earth, and doing, fulfilling our purpose that God created us for here on earth. So, Psalms mentions supernatural beings. Well, that's not mentioned anywhere in Genesis that God created supernatural beings. So there's things that clearly existed before God began to make the earth habitable. So if we look at, so, and this is why I think reading parallel scriptures is very important to do, because different translators translate things differently, but they have reasons for why they're doing it. So if we look at the Tanakh, and I don't think I have that up there. No, I don't. Um, If we read the Jewish publication of the Society of English Translation of the Old Testament, This is how they translated Genesis 1, 1 through 2. When God began to create heaven and earth, the earth being unformed and void, with darkness over the surface of the deep and a wind from God sweeping over the water. So in other words, when God gets around to speaking, there's already something there. And verse 2 confirms that for us. We, we see that in verse 2, okay? There's already something there. So it may be begin or began, okay? I'm not trying to make your brain numb with grammar. I'm trying to, like, consolidate this down in a way that's easier for you guys to understand, too, because grammar is not my strong suit at school. So. And if we look at other verses in Scripture... Um, so the word for um, begin or began, which is um, berset, if we look at, there's other, that word is used 42 other times in scripture. Um, one of them is in Exodus 6.28, on the day when the Lord spoke to Moses. See, when God began, when the Lord spoke. So there's no definite period of time. It's just when. In Genesis 1, 1, there's no definite period of time. And there's 41 other examples in the Hebrew Bible that convey this same feeling that while and when, but there's not a definite time frame. So what, when they did the Jewish Publication Society, they took the same word and they looked through all the other passages of Scripture and said, how is this word translated in every other instance where this word was used? Oh, well, the same word is used in Genesis 1.1, so let's translate it exactly the same way through all the rest of Scripture, okay? So they stayed consistent, and they're not, and I'm not saying that any translator is changing words to make it fit a creation account or a preferred belief, because there's reasons they, ch- and we're going to look at why they chose what they did, and you're going to see that in a little bit. But the Jewish 
translators, they aren't doing it because they care about the creation debate. They really don't. They care about the integrity of scripture and trying to figure out exactly what the original author intended and meant, okay? So Hebrew, originally, I don't know if you knew that, they didn't have vowels. Can you imagine trying to write and <laughs> trying to understand what people are saying with no vowels? I mean, I'm telling you, the texting today, all these like little abbreviations, they don't have vowels either. Have you tried to decipher some of these text messages people say? I mean, it'll make your brain hurt. Man, so can you imagine a whole language with no vowels, right? All right. So imagine if, if you're a Hebrew scribe and all of a sudden, you know, vowels are coming into the language and you got to take these scrolls and suddenly you have to add vowels to these words, okay? So what, what do we do? What, what do you decide? So can you pull up that other slide, Christian, that has the, uh, in the beginning? Yeah, there we go. Okay. So you look at the top line, okay? That's, that, that's the Hebrew word, or the Hebrew words, okay? Now, if you go down to the right and the left. So on the right and on the left. So there's two vowels. The one on the right would be an E. So if you put an E... In there, you have in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. See that just that little line, just an E. That's it. It's an E. But then, if you go on the other side, I think it's the next slide, Christian. The other side. The only difference when God began to create. One vowel. So this, this scribe is responsible for trying to figure out there's no vowel in the Hebrew language. Which vowel do I put in? But do you see how it could go either way? So it could be that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth could be a title for the book of Genesis. And then you see on the other side, it could actually be, hey, when God began to create the heavens and the earth, this is how it was. This is what was already there. Okay, so, so we can logically conclude, right? So verse 1 is either the heading of Genesis, okay, to which the creative act actually, or the story about creation would actually start in verse 2, which is setting up the circumstances for verse 3, which is a description of God's first creative act, which was to create light, Okay. Now, what if I say, now I went home and drank coffee? You're like, okay, and? Like, you know, there's got to be more to the story, right? If I just stop there, that's not a full sentence. There's, there's something else that you're waiting to happen, right? So, if we look at verse 2, right, it's called a conjunction, okay? All right, so if you're using this in the Hebrew narrative, the way that you write Hebrew to sort of give an idea that there's an event followed by an event, okay, you use a vav plus a verb form, and that's going to let you know there's a sequence of events coming, okay? So Genesis 1.1 doesn't really begin the narrative because there's no vav, what they call in the Hebrew, and no verb. So it's not a whole complete sentence. But then we get to verse 2, and we have our full sentence. But we also have the now. So verse 2 is separate. Okay, in relation to verse 1, and it's not a sequence. So verse 2 doesn't happen because of verse 1. So it's not like, God created the heavens and the earth, and then the next thing he does is the spirit hovers over the surface of the water. So 1 is, does that make sense? 1 is completely separate from verse 2, okay? If you've looked in your Bibles in Genesis 2, 
you might notice either at the very end of verse 1 or at the very beginning of verse 2, a little dash. Do I have that up there? Yeah, see the dash right there at the end of earth before the 2? So your Bibles may have that or it might be right after the 2. So the reason they've done that is the translators have done this to let you know that in between earth and now, or even for the word now, okay, there's no English equivalent. There's no English equivalent for that word. So, so they're sort of having to put in the best English word that they can use to try to help us understand what the passage is saying, okay? So when you're reading your Bible, it's important to pay attention to those little details if you see those little marks in your Bible, and then go back in the beginning in the preface and see why the translators put that there. I don't know if you've ever read the preface of your Bible, but if you haven't, you should. You should. Okay? So there's two ways to look at verse 1. Okay? Either one is... A title like what we talked about, independent from verse 2, okay? Or when God is beginning to do these things, this and this is going to happen, okay? So verse 2 sets the circumstance, and verse 3 begins the description of God's creative work. Now think about it. So we already talked about God is eternal, okay? So if you have this pre-existent material, now the earth was formless and empty and darkness was over the face of the deep and the spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the waters. Uninhabitable. You have this pre-existing material before God begins to create. He's eternal. We have no idea when the earth came into existence. Could have been millions of years. I mean, millions of years to God in an eternity is just barely a pin drop. So the earth is possibly millions of years old. We don't know. We weren't there. But we can't use Genesis, right? That People can't use Genesis and say, well, that's false. The earth can't be millions of years old. That's impossible. We just looked at the, it's possible, Okay. It is possible they might be correct. And then God's like, you know what? We have all this water. It's dark. I mean, what do you have to have for life to flourish? You need light. We gotta have land, right? We gotta have land, we gotta have light. You know, we need to have oxygen. There's all these things that we need. We need to have an environment to, that sustains all of those things. That's why we have plants. Okay, all these things. So God's like, you know, I want to create some humans, but this is not habitable. Okay? They can't live here the way it is right now. So I got to do something. So the earth was formless and empty. The darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the water. So in the Hebrew, the literal translation is waste and desolate. Waste and desolate. You know, just like a desert, we call that a wasteland, right? Wasteland doesn't mean it doesn't exist. It just means it's uninhabitable. Or it's not a great place to live, basically. You know, it's harsh environment, okay? It's uninhabitable for life to thrive and flourish. The earth, there, it's all dark. There's no light. We know there's no light because in verse 3, he created the light. So light didn't exist yet. It's all dark. As we know it, there's no dry land that we know of from reading in this. And if there is any, it's still uninhabitable. In some translations, you may see the word deep capitalized. And it's because deep is a Hebrew word which is actually a name for a specific water body of water, the primeval ocean. Uh, the Septuagint uses a technical name, uh, abuso, which is also translated abyss, just deep abyss water. And we know there is water because it tells us the Spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the water. So this wasn't just 
some water just floating in space out there where God just decided, let me, let me add some land to this, this water just floating around in space. I mean, it's possible. It's just not very plausible. So as of now, there's still no creative act that we've been told about. So as I said, there is something already in existence, okay? And we don't know God created the heavens and the earth. It would mean heavens just by creating our atmosphere. We know he created stars, but we don't know how many stars. Did he create stars before? Maybe. Did he create other planets before? Maybe. We don't know. We're not told. See, we get a lot of our traditional belief systems because much of what we rely on are things that have been passed down through tradition, tradition, even early church fathers. And none of them were reading and studying the scriptures in Hebrew. In fact, maybe only two or three even could read and understand the Hebrew language. And I'm not downing them at all. They did the best they could with what they had available, but we can't just take everything that somebody else says and put it on the same level as scripture and then filter our preconceived ideas through those lenses when we look at scripture in the creation account. So these passages have been viewed for years, right? Either one, you believe in science, or two, you believe in the Bible. Or you believe the earth is millions of years old, so you know what? You're not a Christian and you don't believe the Bible. Or, will you believe the earth, that, that in a young earth 6,000 years, well, you're just an idiot? Don't you know? I'm, the point is, is why are we fighting about this kind of stuff? The point is, God is the origin. The entire point, again, of the writer of Genesis in these first few verses is to tell us that everything exists because God is a creator of all things. It's him, the visible and the invisible. And we don't know what all else was created before then, so we can't walk around with judgmental attitudes thinking that we got it all figured out. Because we don't. We weren't there. There was no video of creation. We weren't there, okay? And we need to remember that this is not a science textbook. The writer's not trying to give us zoology lessons, science lessons. The writer is conveying reality to us, the reality that everything we see and don't see exists because God is the origin and the creator of all of it. It is confirmed in the New Testament, and we're going to end with these passages because I can't say it in my own words any clearer or better than they have. John chapter 1, verses 1 through 5. And we really talked a lot about this when we covered the Gospel of John. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. This one was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him. And apart from him, not one thing came into being that has come into being. In him was life, and the life was the light of humanity. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. Colossians 1, 15 through 17. Who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation? Because all things in the heavens and on the earth were created by him. Things visible and things invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or powers, all things were created through him and for him. And he himself is before all things, and in him all things are held together. So in Genesis, the beginning that we are given is the beginning of God making the earth habitable for human beings. 
and for us to have our purpose to rule over earth and to extend his image throughout the entire earth. That's what is the beginning in Genesis. It's when God began to make the earth habitable for humans. Not a science lesson, but it doesn't disagree with science. You can't separate science, which is natural reality, from God and his creation. You just cannot separate the two. They go together. And so we need to remember, so I hope as we go through Genesis, there's going to be times you're probably going to start looking at me like i got three heads and I'm okay with that. I'm fine with that. But we have to be willing and humble to sort of set aside long-held traditional systems and beliefs and, and to be humble and realize, hey, we don't have all the answers. Maybe there's more we can learn And maybe there's things that we always thought we understood, but maybe we don't have as clear a picture of understanding it as we thought we did. Because when we have that approach to Scripture, number one, we're going to learn more. But it's going to help us have conversations with people who are unbelievers who don't understand. Because the sad fact is, you know what? There are atheists out there that know your Bible better than you do. Because you know what? They've studied it more than you. They will read their Bible. They're an atheist, but you, uh, they're reading your Bible more than most Christians are reading their Bibles. So you can't just come with canned responses. Like, you've got to understand and know what you're talking about with Scripture. You can't just parrot and puppet repeats of what other people say. You need to study it for yourself. And understand and know scripture for yourself. So, and I don't expect everybody to go, oh, go study the Hebrew grammar. I mean, no. But don't be so rigid holding to like the veggie tale version of creation that you're going to tell everybody else, you're going to hell and you're a heretic because you believe something different about the earth. Okay? So. Does anybody have any comments? I think I have like two minutes or something. Oh, oh, I got people fired up today. There's so much to comment on. I don't even know where to begin, but um, one of the things we're real, real certain of is that evolutionary theology is totally inaccurate. Yes. (laughs) Yes. <laughs> because when Darwin come up with his theory, he thought uh, that in the, there wasn't any beginning. There was infinity. Mm-hmm. And now science itself believes that there was a beginning, whether you believe it was, life was four million years old or whatever. There was a beginning. Well... Somewhere it talks about, I think you mentioned in the beginning, whenever that was, once we discovered DNA and it's information, it's an information system, a functional information system, not just information. It's not not possible in any mathematical um, equation that that could have happened. Right. By random selection. Exactly. Yeah. It's, it's impossible. Even if you believe that life began four million years ago, that's not enough time <laughs> to find all the needles in the haystack, so to speak. A, a good book is The Signature in the Cell by Dr. Stephen Myers, and you can listen to John Lennox. He's very good. If yeah. you really John believe Lennox in science in its true form, even from that standpoint, uh, evolution is more religion because that if you're an atheist, you have nothing else. Mm-hmm. Or you're going to say that, you know, spores came from another planet. Well, where'd that come from? Yeah. You know, yeah. they just kick the can down the road, but it's not. You can feel confident that 
in your Bible is way more accurate than evolutionary theology. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Did Tammy leave? I know Tammy wanted to say something. Hey, Tammy. Oh, where'd she go? And not to mention, evolution does not move by leaps and bounds anyway. Where is the in between if it's evolution and it's only a theory? Let's close in prayer. Right. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your word and that it's the foundation for our lives and that we can uh, firmly stand on your word for the truth about who we are, the truth about creation, the truth about the world that we live in, the invisible things and the visible things. And Lord, we just praise you and thank you so much for your, your might and your power and your goodness and your faithfulness. And we just thank you that you are God. And I just pray for our worship time this morning that we would exalt and magnify and glorify your holy name, Lord. That we would honor you with the glory that you are due out of awe and reverence for you and who you are. And I pray for Eric as he brings the message this morning, Lord. I pray that as he, the message that he shares, Lord, I pray that it would... um, penetrate the depths of our hearts, Lord, that we would have a new perspective, a greater perspective of your character and your holiness, and that as we learn about your holiness this morning, Lord, that we would no longer um, be so casual and irreverent in our approach and our worship to you, Lord, but that we would recognize that we should approach you and honor and worship you and glorify you and sing to you with awe and reverence, Lord. And we just ask these things in your name.